Uh, fantastic. So, so um, thanks a lot for, for, for all the super nice questions and discussions afterwards. Uh, so I just wanted to say, I think we're, I like having opinions because I like to learn stuff, right? So I say stuff so that people can shoot me down because that's why I'm in the profession I am, right? And, and I also don't believe in truth. I think that's purely a mathematical concept. So I don't believe anyone can be right, right? So uh, part of this is then, now we went through this first thing, which I hope then, hopefully some of you agreed and some of you might have seen this a lot before, but now you've got this notion of how we can think about non-parametrics and the example was these Gaussian processes. I told you all the good stuff because I like these things. If you start working on them, you'll see all the bad stuff that you need to get around, but it can be nice to live in this fluffy illusion from it from the beginning, because I think it's important to work on things that are pretty. Cool. So what I'm going to talk about now is probabilistic numerics, uh, which is a really bad name uh, for something that's actually blatantly obvious, but really, really cool. Right. So what I'm going to talk about is first, let's abstract things again of what we're doing. So this is a little bit of a summary of some of the things I said before. So we have the world. And what we want to do is we want to understand some concept of it. We want to answer some form of question. So now the method way of doing this is this notion of great. What I try to do, I go out and I figure out whatever the next fancy algorithm that does this thing. And then poof, I hope again answer out. Hopefully I convinced you that you have to do this very carefully because anyone that gives you an answer gives you an answer because they assume something. And if these assumptions haven't been clearly stated, then I don't want to hear your answer, right? If it's something that's non-trivial. So the way I talked about things and the way we talked about building models is this very high horse way of thinking about the world is that you say, cool, so I got the world. What I'm going to do first is that I'm just going to understand everything about the world. Right, so I'm going to model the distribution of the world. And if I've done that, well, that then solves every problem there is, right? First, it provides me with explainability, because as we talked about with this notion of the prior and the parameterization being a reference, marginalization of our assumption provides us with a reference that allows us to explain every solution. Great. And then it provides us with generalization, because if I learn, if I can actually learn the joint distribution, that implies that I can answer every possible prediction question because they use computations, right? So this is the thing of thinking about things like this, that effectively means that in these two statements, all these models or all these methods that I showed exist before. And that leads to this funny image that you might have seen Right? We are the Bayesians, we, you will be assimilated. Your technological distinctiveness will be considered a special case of our own. Resistance is futile. That is true. If it's useful or not, that's a different story. So let's then think about, pause my arguments here. Let me have to think. You can say, oh yeah, let me then convince you to try and convince you again why the importance of having an explanation for doing something. So possibly, usually the first example of machine learning that people would put up is, you know, the discovery of sources 100, 230 years ago or something when least squares was invented, right? So the notion of least squares was that people were thinking about this problem. I have three data points and I want to fit the line to them. Which line should I pick? There's no line that goes through all of them. Now I have a problem. Which is the correct line? This is so trivial that we don't even think about it anymore, but that's the problem people thought about. It led to linear regression that was driven in two different ways by Lagrange and Gauss at the same time. Lagrange had this notion of some, an algorithm that reduces an error, while Gauss actually built a statistical model. They both lead to the same algorithm, if you think about it, the way you would solve it if you want to make a decision from it, but they have a fundamentally different story to them. 
So what's the benefit of that story? Well, now I'm going to take something a bit more scary to see how things can go wrong. So in 1904, this person called Spearman wrote a paper called fa about factor analysis. Anyone seen this paper? It's a paper people should read now because it's a very, very scary paper. So what this paper was about was that it says, it's in psychology, in experimental psychology, and it basically says in the intro, psychology is a too, I don't know, uh, intuitive field. We don't have enough scientific rigor, blah, blah, blah. We want to be scientific about things. So then he proposed this notion of how you can take measurements and how you can find the important factors in this. And now you can do mathematical analysis and this and blah, 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 right? Cool. Now we don't have to think about it. He derived an algorithm for that. That then later led to the notion of general intelligence and people started thinking about things like eugenics, right? Because they didn't question what these factors actually were, which assumptions these things actually came from. The same algorithm, effectively the only one of the uh, parts of this, was also written by Hotelli, this is PCA, right, in 1936, where the concept of the factor is clearly defined through a statistical model, right? No one that will do PCA, we will always think about an eigenvalue problem on a covariance matrix, duh, right? That's the algorithm, but there's an underlying statistical model that leads to that one, that clearly state the assumption that your latent, the factors that you look at are distributed as a Gaussian. If you know that and go back to these experiments, you will all say that these are nonsense. But because they forgot about that, they led to some really, really bad things. So read that paper, it is fun. It's like, well, it's not fun, but, but because part of it is that I think we're actually doing exactly the same thing now, right? Learned nothing. Cool. So now, if we have this concept of saying then, cool, we should build these statistical models. We shouldn't think that much about, you know, they have all these benefits if we can. So let's then make things a little bit harder. So let's say that I do what's called active learning. And this is part, you saw this in the afternoon yesterday. It's very nice talk on experimental design. And this is gonna to align to this. So let's say that I want to learn about the world. We've decided that. But now I've only been in Switzerland. Now, as part of my learning procedure, if I'm understanding the world, I'm allowed to choose where I should move to next, right? I might also have a task that I want to figure out who makes the best chocolate or something, which might also decide things you go. Don't go to Sweden. Uh, that would one decision that a good model would pick up, all right? So now, now the modeling procedure is now very different because now, I have decisions that allows me to input data that I can learn from and I have to learn from them, right? So this is a completely different scenario. And that's what we're gonna try and talk about now. So how many here are familiar with things like base opt? Seeing these things, couple. Okay, so I'm gonna just hint at this. I'm not gonna talk about it in detail, but what I want to convey with this slide is if you want this procedure, of being able to choose what I should look at next, the concept of quantifying your belief is essential. So let's say I have seen these red points and now I just fit a function to that. And my task is to find the minima of this function, right? Now, if I used to have a line, if I used to have the dashed blue line here, the decisions that I can make would be kind of weak. Because the only thing I can go to is say, oh, I think the minima is here. That's about the best that you can do. If you have an uncertainty in every level here, you can do something much richer. Because now you can say, you can balance the two things we often think about in decision-making, an exploration with an exploitation. You have a region here where you don't know a whole lot, right? So you can go and see there, you can go to Slovakia because maybe they have great chocolate. I have no idea. For me, that will be exploration, right? Exploitation will be going to Norway because they're probably like Sweden, have shit chocolate, right? So having the notion 
of an uncertainty is really, really important to making sequential decision making or making a richer strategy for how to make decisions. So then it comes to then if we agree that uncertainty is important. We often think about quantifications of uncertainty because each uncertainty is not equal and decisions should be made differently based on them. So we often talk about an aleatoric or a stochastic uncertainty, which is the randomness that's inherent in a system or noise, if you want to, in your measurements. It doesn't matter how much you redo this, it's never going to happen. Right? You really want to have that uncertainty aside because your decisions will be fundamentally different from your epistemic uncertainty, which will relate to your ignorance of the underlying system. This you want to reduce, the first one you just want to determine, right? So these are the two things that people often talk about when in terms of decision-making systems. So now I'm going to add a third one, which is a very machine learning or computer science -y part of uncertainty, and that is computational uncertainty. So anything that we do, Anything that we do with computation, we have to do finite computations. Most of the time, we, or nearly all the time, we do approximations of things. Now we can compute till the end of the world and we might get better results. Can we deal with the computational uncertainty in a better way, right? Now what I'm gonna to try to allude to in this part of the talk is that yeah, we can in exactly the same framework as before. There's actually no difference. Now, this opens up a lot of really interesting thoughts about how to think about statistical inference. So, questions that we would like to answer from being able to know the computational uncertainty is that computation is expensive. I want to know how much knowledge will I gain from computing more. Think about this as experimental design. You have someone coming into surgery, right? And then you can test everything on them. I can guarantee when you've tested every medical test you can do and then they'll be dead, right? So now what you want to do is you want to figure out how much more precise can I be if I run that test and balance that with the fact that, oh shit, they're going to be slightly worse by the time I've taken this test, da, 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 da. That's the support that you need to make this decision, right? So in what order, what should I compute? What should I do my computation on in order to reduce my uncertainty as much as possible? And when you finish, how should I trust the computation that I've done, right? How much uncertainty could I reduce by continuing a computation? And very importantly, and this is, I think, one of the problems with when we think about machine learning as systems, is that we put all these components together that are massively different performance, right? And then there's no point building a system where you're really exact at one point and really crap at what it feeds through, right? And I think we often do that. So how can you be clever so that you know how precise, how much computation uncertainty you've got left so when you turn the result of this into a downstream task. You can make further decisions of how much compute you should do further on. Cool. So now I'm going to stop talking about chocolate. I'm going to try to at least. Uh, hopefully I didn't offend any. Well, I'm okay offending Scandinavians because they're kind of like me. So um, and Swiss people, I said you have nice chocolate. So that's okay. Good. So what we're going to do is that we are now going to introduce a quantity of interest. So we talked before when I said, I have the world and there's something I want to understand about the world. In classic machine learning, this is just learning the distribution of the world, but we're going to try and make this more interesting. So we're going to say that there is some quantity of interest that I want to understand. We said that machine learning, everyone's pretty much said this, it's just, you know, curve fitting. So the example I'm going to use in the beginning is that I have this function that's latent, I don't know it, and I have a quantity of interest that I want to compute, which is the integral of this function, right? Now you can already understand that by having that task, different parts of this space becomes differently important, right? The parts where I have no mass 
are just not important at all and so forth. So by introducing a task or a quantity of interest, now I have something that I can guide my decision making. So why do I choose integration? I just love this quote. It's from a new book that I think just came out as a PDF by Philip Henning, Mike Osborne and Hans Kirsting. I think this is just funny. They are even more Bayesian than we are, most people in this room. Integration is a significant numerical problem in many fields of science and engineering. It's a key step in inference where it's encountered an average of the many states of the world consistent with observed data. Indeed, the provocative Bayesian view is that integration is the single challenge separate, separating us from systems that fully automate statistics. More speculatively still, such systems may even exhibit artificial intelligence. Yeah, it's a fantastic book. Um, that's out there as a PDF for free called Probabilistic Numerics. Cool. So what we then want to do, if we look at it in more detail, is that we are interested in looking at, we have a function that is unknown, and then we have the integral that we want to somehow estimate of this. And at the moment, we have nothing, okay? So what we're going to do, this is kind of the slide I had before, is that we're going to say that we have now, oh, we have some form of likelihood, which is just this function, and then we have some form of measure, a prior probability distribution that we're going to integrate over to try and get this integral. So now I'm going to give a historical account on this, because this is kind of funny. So while this topic the way i'm later going to derive it is something that feels like it just come up the last couple of years it turns out that this is really old so behind the iron curtain there was a lot of work by this person called albert soldin and what he did never really has been known here until very recently so what he did was he said something like this he was interested in computing the integral here this thing and then he made a very simple assumption. He said that the difference between here is a Wiener process. So he basically said, I got these uh, increments, differences between a function, which is a Wiener process. And then what he did was that he said, cool, I'm gonna find the error minimizing estimator of that process. Now, so you can see here, what we have is that I got the integral here of this unknown quantity that I have, that I can sample from. And then here, I have an algorithm that is supposed to estimate this, okay? And what he did was that he tried to estimate the error minimizing, the best estimator of that under this notion that U was following, the increments of U was following this Wiener process. So, it turned out, if you do that, this here is the optimal, um, the optimal uh, estimator of this. We all recognize what that is, right? It's not rocket science, it's a trapezoid rule, right? So what he said, why is this cool? Well, it's kind of cool because what he did was that he connected an algorithm to a function. So he said, this is how I think the function behaves if the function behaves like that, then this is the best way of solving that function, right? Under this notion of um, this error measure, okay? So that was kind of the first step. At the same time, there was this fella in the UK who thought about this differently. So now, in this case, he specified specifically, which Solin did not do, that this measure that I specify is a prior probability of the integrand. Now what you can do is you can do base rule on this. So instead of trying to estimate what is the optimal thing, which is effectively the maximum, uh, um, I guess type two maximum likelihood of this, here he's just deriving the posterior of this. So now what that leads to, which is very, very interesting, I think, is that the trapezoid rule comes back again. It has exactly the mean of this posterior is also the trapezoid rule, 
But now you have a variance around it, right? Now you actually have an uncertainty. There you say, if you just have to do one computation, if this is the data that you have to compute, cool, you use the trapezoid rule. But what you can now do is you can now start saying, hang on, I can actually pick data points so that I reduce my variance as possible of the estimate of the integral, right? Does that notion come clear? How important it is to now have this knowledge, this variance part of this? It's too late in the day. Yeah, uh, I, this part of the lecture is going to be a bit slower, I hope. So do stop me with questions on this if there's something that's confusing. Right? Part of this is exactly the same, right? It's exactly the same as this case where he said, uh, say if my top, no. Oh, does someone have a USB charger? I think my computer has died. And um, hang on. Oh, this is annoying. C, USB C. Does anyone have a USB C? Oh, uh, oh. Awesome. This is embarrassing. Now ask me questions now. Oh. oh, come on. Yeah, I think I have to, sadly. Should have turned it off in the break. <laughs> yeah. I think I sadly lost it. Ah. What the hell happened here? Is it starting? I don't know. It's just dead. It's charging. So maybe it needs a few minutes. Later. Yeah, maybe. It... Oh, <laughs> super sorry about this. It was fully charged when I came in. Shouldn't the laptop last for a bit longer than this? Uh, this is uh, supposed to work. Uh, sometimes the uh... Let's see if it's this. No, it's it's it, that's yeah. Sometimes at least in my then laptop only the day. Yeah. yeah, I know. I think so. I have an IBM charger, and that one works on this. Oh. Um. Do you have any PDF? I do. Let me see if I can. I do. You do the user screen. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you open, if you open your laptop, then we can. Oh, you do. Let, let's see if it, it looks like it's shining. I don't know if it 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 normally has very many hours of battery. Uh, Oh. Um, this one works better. Otherwise, I, I, if I start the Dropbox, it should still be in my. You see now it's, it's there. Come on, why is there now? Oh, no, there we go. Whew. Okay, maybe Dell likes Dell. Thank you. Um, you have the Zoom link somewhere? Or no, to... we took the ID. Okay, okay. Uh, I'll be, yeah. I'll be down. Right.
Uh, yeah, I know, I know. So this is the second worst failure I had during a lecture. So one time I gave a lecture at eight o'clock in the morning and I came in and I had forgotten my password. It was just gnawing my head. I could not remember it. And I thought I made a spiel so that everyone thought it was something else and I had to leave the room. And then I left the room and thought, oh, that's it. Uh, and when you ask people to come in at eight o'clock in the morning, you really should um, let me see. Uh, we need to. It's fine. We need to. Uh, yeah, we need to open. Um, so maybe see them still there. Yeah. No, it doesn't seem to. You can just type like. Uh, oh, I need to. Ng sign in. Sign in. So I think I need to be signed in. Uh, yeah. So then we just do. Uh, what do you say? Join right. And then it's meeting ID eight eight five one six nine six seven five eight eight. And then we need the password. Yeah, uh, choose that quickly. Okay. Six eight. Mm, that's coming that's now, right. I think. Invalid meeting ID. Join a meeting. Oh. Um, it's okay. We we also you said that we have time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We do have time. It's just um. So. So, launch meeting. Okay, that one didn't work. So, Zoom, join. Okay, what was it? It was uh, eight, eight, five. Eight, five. 8896 1696 Yeah, cool. Passcode is 6878 Oh, what? Nothing here. Why can't I? Oh, this is. Lean. Okay, it's, I think it's holding. Yeah. Yeah. 68. 68. 42. Cool. And I can join this. Um, Alice two. What has happened? Here we go. Oh. Uh, 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 yeah. You just need to share your screen. There we go. So now I need to find the Zoom window. It should be this one. Share screen. Yeah. Cool. Oh, um, uh, that is very. Why is it showing like that? Uh, it's because. Uh, um. Hang on. Uh, I think it's, um, let's see. Oh, uh, and then there we go. 
Right. Uh, Wait, I think it's, we don't have that. Okay, oh, it's because I changed resolution. Stop share, share screen, share. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Right. Sorry about that. Hopefully I've convinced everyone that you should be using Emacs as a window manager uh, of how simple that was to change resolution and getting this to work. But, you know, it's <laughs> so basically where we were was just showing that, which I just wanted to, to show this notion of that. Actually, people have thought about this before, where they effectively thought about how can I build statistical models that tells me what computation I should be doing, right? Uh, so now, why did they think of this? Well, there's two reasons to think about this, and this is, is probably the reason why they thought about it. So if we take a concept such as round off arrows, so this is what Neumann apparently said, are strictly very complicated, but uniquely defined number theoretical functions of the inputs. Yet our ignorance of their true nature is such that we best treat them as random variables. And the reason why I wanted to put that quote there is that very often we see probabilistic models as just a burden. And we have to think, do I actually need to have all this blah, blah, blah to get on what's the actual benefit of it, right? And it's a computational overload all the time. Actually, very often it cannot be a computational overload, which is kind of the cool thing in this side. Sure, you can spend all your time in the world trying to understand exactly every process that goes through a CPU of where rounding errors happen, or you can just model it statistically on the outside, right? Now, the former might be a lot easier to do, right? And that was why they were thinking about these problems, to actually save time, right? Cool. So, I'm going to talk then about some papers that are much more recent around this. And here are a couple of them. Really, there was a paper written in uh, 2015 by some of the authors of that book, and also Mark Girolami, who sits in civil engineering here. And this is a really cool paper that starts with uh, the title or part of the abstract saying, a call to arms, which is kind of funny, but, but that's a very good paper. These two papers here, this paper is quite recent and it's absolutely fantastic. It's probably, I would say that's the nicest paper I've read for the last 20 years, which probably is my machine learning career. So that's a super nice paper. And this paper here is, a historical view on a lot of these things. This is a much more lightweight view. It's the same authors, and this is a super nice paper to read. Um, so I'm sure we'll share the slides in one way or the other. So let's then try and make this a bit more formal. So the notion that I want to convey is this. So if we think about what the numerical method is, it's something that estimates a function's latent property given the result of computation. If we now contrast that with statistical inference, we can see that these things are pretty much exactly the same thing. The normal way we see statistical inference is statistical inference takes data in the form of measurements of observed variables and aims to predict a quantity of interest from them. While a numerical algorithm takes data in the form of evaluation of computation and aims to predict predictions of some form of quantity of interest. Can't we now just think about them actually being the same thing? Can we just think about numerical inference or computation as a whole as your statistical inference. So the formalization that I really like of this problem is from this retro perspective paper from 2019. This is not a graphical model. It's more just a sketch of how things are combined. So the notion is this, that I have up on the, this side here, I've got some form of unknown quantity. Right? So let's say that this is the classic machine learning scenario. 
maybe you want to do regression, maybe you want to do classification, you have some data there. And then what you have here is that you've got a quantity of interest. Maybe that quantity of interest is this conditional if you're doing regression. You have a data, you learn everything about the data. As we said, now you can compute this conditional and you can use this to do predictions. So now that means that there's a true or an operation F that you can do if you knew your latent quantity to get your quantity of interest. That's not machine learning, as we said. So in machine learning, we add two more components, right? So what I now have is that I've got a sample set. I've got a finite set of samples from the latent quantity. And what I try to do is that I try to design an algorithm or a method that tries to mimic this. The same thing as applying this algorithm on this data is the same thing as applying the true operator on the joint on the true distribution of the data. That's the thing I'm trying to approximate. And then we can make this active learning, where in an active learning scenario, what we do is that we also have another operator. We have an operator S where our domain, the training data that we have, is not actually fixed. It's part of the model itself. So what we're trying to do now is that we're trying to effectively make this graph commute, right? That's the notion of this, okay? And this you can see any machine learning algorithm as effectively. So now, one then of issues, computational issues that appears when you do normal your statistical modeling, exactly the way I've explained it, the way you should be doing it, now I'm gonna shoot myself in the foot, is that what we often do is that we say, cool, I know I have this underlying true distribution of the data, it's not accessible, I can get sample sets from that, I'm gonna try and design an algorithm so that I approximate, I find some model of that, and then I can play the same, apply the same operator of interest as I could if I, if I had the true distribution, right? That's often the steps that we do when we say this nice thing about, oh, we can separate decision from modeling, right? First we do modeling, then we do inference, and then we do decisions. Okay, that's great, but it also becomes kind of tedious computationally, right? Now I have this decision loop. Maybe if I know this thing, shouldn't I be learning something that's relevant for determining the quantity of interest directly, right? Okay. So what we want to do really is try and think about it as this instead. We want to design directly an algorithm that somehow is targeted towards the quantity of interest specifically, right? That doesn't just learn general things, right? Take the notion of an integral as we started off with. Sure, if I learn everything about the function, if I manage to understand the function, I can clearly compute its integral, but actually, if I want to do this in a computationally sensible way, shouldn't I know what part of the function are relevant for computing the integral? Shouldn't that be a part of my learning process itself, right? Do you have any questions on this? Thoughts? No? So this is all clear. Very good. So let's then think what we can do if we want to apply this notion to something as a quadrature uh, scenario, right? So what we could do is that here I have this function that I cannot, um, I, I can't, I want to compute the integral of. Now, as we know, is that clearly dependent on where I put my, my, uh, um, where I put my sample point, I will get a completely different estimate of what this integral is, right? And now this is what we want a statistical model to help us with. I want to know if I put my sample point here and put my box in that place, then it will affect the integral this much, right? This is the notion that we want to encode. So the things I want to think about then is decisions of which algorithm to use, efficient use of an 
an expensive algorithm by taking in this quantity of interest directly and being able to make a decision of when I stop some form of computation. So examples of this, we're going to talk about quadrature in specific, but these are more, right? Quadrature, where should I query the integrand? If you think about solving a stochastic differential equation or something, you're running a simulation, which step size should you have and where should you have that step size? Reinforcement learning, where should you do rollouts, right? These are exactly computational questions, they're not modeling questions. Can we turn them into modeling questions so that we can just use exactly the same framework as we had before? So let's then think about quadrature in specific. So what I have here is that the thing I would like to compute is this. So I'm going to see some data, why? And what I want to derive is, is a posterior distribution or distribution over predictive distribution over the integral f of this. And now if I have that, then it allows for this notion of doing active learning by reducing uncertainty around it. So we're going to use Gaussian processes for this. I'm just going to hint of why this is a sensible thing. So let's say I specify a prior over functions like this. I have the GP. And then over each of these functions, I've computed the integral. Here, I'm going to show the distribution of this. Now, I'm just going to randomly sample points in this case. And of course, what you're going to see is a reduction of the variance of what the integral is. So if I start seeing points on this, you can kind of understand this behavior, right? This is not surprising. What I want to do now is that I want to relate where I sample to how much they affect this, right? We happy about this? Cool. So then the simplest or the first um, uh, way of thinking about this was proposed in a paper by Tony O'Hagan. I think Carl at least will agree with me that Tony has done an enormous amount of work way ahead of its time. And people have forgotten a lot of these things. This paper is from 1991. And then people started talking about this 15 years later. Right? And he's still very humble about it, which I think is very cool. So the notion here is that, that said in this paper, is that what you should think about is that we want to formulate the joint distribution of the integral and the observed data. So we're going to specify a model of that that looks like this. So I'm going to have a prior over the function. So I'm going to say, this is what I believe the function to be. This is where I input my knowledge. Then I'm going to have a likelihood that says, if this is the function, this is how likely observations should look like that. And then I have this concept here, which is effectively saying, if I believe the function is this, this is the integral of that function, right? That's just that this here is the integral computation, okay? But the important thing is I specify it as a conditional. So here I know the function. I know the instantiation of the function, okay? So now in this case, these terms are defined very, very simply because it makes the map beautiful. So we're actually specifying a delta function as this conditional probability. So it basically says, if I have the function, if I compute that, there's basically no mismatch here. There's no noise in this computation per se. And then there's no noise in the data either. So I have a delta function over this, okay? So now you can do, if you now specify a Gaussian process prior over F, and now you derive this joint distribution, which will effectively imply that you have to compute the integral of these Gaussian processes. It's gonna look exactly like this, right? So you have your normal Gaussian process, which is this part here, which relates to Y. And then I have this leftover unit variate Gaussian, which is integrating up the mean. And this here is the variance part of this, okay? So the math just falls out from that, from this simple definition 
of all this simple model. Okay, so now what you can do is that you can actually compute all of these things here for certain covariance functions. And now you can do exactly this search strategy that we had before, where you can start thinking about which point should I pick here in order to reduce the variance of the predictor as much as possible. Fine. So which Gaussian process prior should we use and how does this affect things? So what you can pick is you can pick this really strange looking covariance function, which is just a Brownian motion. So you effectively have just these steps. So you have this piecewise stepwise function. So that's a covariance function that looks something like this. If you do that, and then you follow through with the math, and you actually derive the posterior of this. Now, the posterior mean, again, comes back just as the trapezoid rule, right? So this was, again, just the derivation. It's the third time it's done. First, we derived the point estimate. Then we derived through, through uh, Larkin's work. This, and here, it was, again, derived exactly through the normal Gaussian process formalism. So now this here is the mean of this. Then the interesting thing, oh, what's happening? I'll do this. So it's a normal trapezoid rule. Now, the cool thing, as I hinted at before, our algorithm, the algorithm of choice is now tied to the function. If you would pick another function, right? Another function prior, it would lead to a different rule. And even more importantly, the notion of this, why this is so powerful, is that now, if you apply, remember this thing I said about general intelligence of Spearman. Now, I actually know which functions I should apply this rule to, right? I know the assumptions that leads to that rule. So if I find the rule, I can now derive the assumption that it comes from, right? Which is a really, really powerful notion. So this means we can just use statistical inference of where to sample and <laughs> so my point then was exactly the one I made. Now we basically we're back to this problem where we spent an awful amount of work to deriving the, under, the assumption that underlies an algorithm and this is part of it to discover why algorithms, what assumptions the algorithms actually have, so we can know if it's useful to apply them or not, right? This is super useful because it tells us something about the problem. So now we don't have to be in this setting, right, anymore. But would you ever apply statistical inference to compute this? Well, that's a question. In an active learning setting, yes. In a non-active learning setting, why do you care about the variance? You don't. Right? This is the data that you have. Do the optimal thing. You know the rule, right? So I know I'm running a little bit out of time. So where does this question present itself? Well, it presents itself here. I think this is the best example of this. This is minimized in SciPy. Okay? There's this thing called method, and there's all this stuff here, right? Which one should I pick? they all produce different results on different problems. Statistically, that means that they imply a different prior. Should I just try all of them and pick the best one? Well, if I, don't, if I do that and don't know what prior they imply, especially if I'm in the neural network world where my knowledge is input through picking this function or the, the algorithm that I search for, how in the hell do I know what I do, right? What we really would want to know is actually what assumptions do these make about the function? And we would like that statistically so that we can get out and say, oh, I think I'm solving this type of problem, or I want to avoid solving this type of problem and so forth. This is the assumptions that they make. And now having a statistical framework for that, you can actually do this. Of course, you can also do algorithm discovery now, right? Which is really, really cool as well. You can specify a function prior that doesn't exist. You can derive and say, oh, this is a new algorithm. We've never heard about this one. And you can come up with your own name for it. Right? That's the aim of science, right? So there's tons of numerical algorithms for every possible problem, right? 
they all work really well because we've empirically pruned out the ones we don't want. We're also tuning our problems and choosing to solve problems where these algorithms work well. Because they give different results on different on the same problem, that means there is a question, what is the prior they actually implement? Thinking about them statistically allows you to think about that question. So you can also possibly say, if this algorithm worked really well on this data, and it implies this hypothesis, then I can somehow come back and say, oh, that somehow validates that the function actually looks like this. Right? This is also a very valid or important statement. Cool. So I'm going to summarize a little bit because I'm definitely running out of time. So the first thing, I hope that I managed to convince you, even with the break and having to cut a bit, is that probabilistic numerics is just a misnomer. It's nothing new or special at all. Computation is just a latent quantity like anything else. And if you take this notion of statistical inference, what the hell can you make statistical inference over? It's super cool, right? And reading these things is more of a freeing your perspective from the classical machine learning setting to think, cool, anything I got data and observations of and knowledge, this is a framework for thinking about how I can combine them. And that's really cool, be that computation or observations of something. So I think personally, probabilistic numeric is the coolest thing that's happened to machine learning in 20 years, even though it's nothing new, right? Because I really, really like and think this is a super interesting perspective on these things. So most work, I think we're doing today as machine learners is very heuristic advanced in terms of the algorithm. They might work, but we should seek their understanding. And these types of meta models allows us to think about that. So one question, no, I'll skip that one. So I just want to thank tons of people. I've used to have lots of ideas and talk about lots of stuff. Anything that's good, these people came up with, everything that said was wrong, that is my own doing and misunderstanding of what they do. So what I wanted to end with was a couple of rants, right? Because now I think this whole thing is ending. And I used to having the benefit of having been in machine learning for quite a long time, and now being in front of lots of people who are getting into this field, I thought I'll give a couple of points that I think I think are important. So the first thing is this bloody image, right? Uh, yeah, it is cool, but it isn't cool, right? Yeah, it is really interesting, but we're scientists, right? Don't be fooled by magic. Magic is your enemy, right? You're supposed to derive knowledge, something that pops up and you think is cool. Well, fight it then, right? So yeah, I also, I like all these, kind of. They got short legs and are cute, right? I don't like sushi, but yeah, I don't know what to say about it. They're playing an intuitive notion of you have to be impressed by this, right? And saying that this is some form of empirical evaluation, this, I don't care how many times people say, we've taken eight samples and they all look equally good. Well, you've taken eight samples still of something. I don't, I don't know, I, 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 I'm not impressed by that. And I don't think it's interesting. I think we're fooling ourselves by being impressed by it, right? Magic, don't go there, it's bad, right? Cool, rant one. Rant two, you're not special, right? And what I wanted to come to with this is I think an important point. Machine learning has become bonkers as a thing. Like go to New Rips or all these conferences and you're gonna feel like rock stars. And it's cool to be a rock star, maybe, but that's not what we are. We have to remember what we do. We are a field to build a tool for someone else to do something. We don't even have a scientific question, right? What is our scientific question? Yeah, we don't know, right? So we're not the science then. So don't try and be scientific about it. We're not trying to discover anything. We're trying to help people do stuff, right? Now, the danger of it, when we go to these things and pat ourselves on the back and feel really awesome about stuff, is that it leads to what I like to call AI colonialism. And I think this is the worst part 
of what I'm seeing in the community today. So one thing, you're not special. The people are the main experts are the really special people because they know something, right? And you're supposed to help them. And what happens is that one, with this hype that we're blowing up, people think that we have magic. We don't. And I'm tired of going to talk to a physicist who know a lot of cool stuff. And they just look at me, oh, please help me. Here's data. Well, where's your magic wand on this, right? And then what happens with us is that we go off and we think we solve fields, but we're effectively just throwing away their knowledge. The jury is still out if DeepMind crushed protein folding or if they provided any benefit for that. And I'm still doubting that. I think mainly the thing they did is they stamped in all over there, took a measure no one cares about, except for people who understand the whole background. And now everyone in the funding industry thinks protein folding is solved, right? And now has that just put science backwards or has it put it forwards, right? We'll see, but so be very, very careful about that. So I wanted to then finalize with, so remember the machine learning is a tool and not the science. So pick a problem where there's significant knowledge, think about how you parameterize these things, and also, when you publish models, think about the relevance of the exp experimental evaluation. We become way too empirical as a field. I say this thing, when you read a paper, if you need to read the results section, it should be rejected, right? No one's going to do a, a proper statistical evaluation of anything, especially if they're showing 10 images of corgis, right? What the hell is that, right? If it's not clear from the math, it's not there, right? So otherwise, we just get impressed by the wrong reasons, right? So be very, very careful about what these experimental evaluations are supposed to give to you. So with that, I'm going to stop ranting. And I think there's wine at some point in the evening, and then I'll rant some more. <laughs> cool. Thank you.